Good morning and welcome to the Vancouver Island Regional Effective Speaking Competition. My name is Jermaine Chu and I am the BC Effective Speaking Coordinator. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded territories of the Coal Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Stool Whale Tooth Nations. We have a few housekeeping rules to cover. Out of respect to the speakers, judges, and audience, we ask that you are muted during the competition. The competition is being recorded and the videos will be posted on the BCPC website once approved. Please decide prior to speech beginning if you would like your video on or off. We will be monitoring the audio and visual while the speech is underway. Once this meeting is announced as beginning, those entering late will be admitted in between speeches. The format for today is as follows. Each speaker will present a five to six minutes prepared speech with a two minute break for judges to mark. We ask for your cooperation in keeping your systems muted while our judges score. After all prepared speeches are complete, we will have the judges uh, email their marks to the designated email address. We will have a short 10 to 15 minute break, then commence the impromptu section of competition. The impromptu Speeches will be two to three minutes each and will be presented in reverse order. The speakers will not know the topic of the speech until they are given three minutes to prepare prior to their turn. After the completion of the speeches, we will tally the scores and then announce the top three names. The gold medalists will continue on to the provincial competition, which is held on April the 23rd, 2022, uh, on Zoom with details to follow. So let's start and have some fun. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce to you speaker one. Is effective speaking still relevant today in a society where social networks dictate the pace of information? Is effective speaking still relevant today in a society where social networks dictate the pace of information? Speaker one. Imagine you're a teenager in today's day and age where social media has dominated your lifestyle and you don't even realize it. Now, imagine you're scrolling through Instagram Reels. For those of you that aren't familiar with what that is, it's Instagram's most popular feature a section where you have an endless supply of videos that are customized to your taste, all the way from classical music, to comedy, to TV shows, everything in between, and so much more. Good afternoon, esteemed judges, ladies and gentlemen, fellow cadets. I am Corporal Badrani, and it is a pleasure to be here talking to all of you today. A general statement that most Instagram users can attest to is the fact that you have around, let's say up to that seven seconds, and up to that seven second mark, most users have one foot in the door and one foot out. And in those seven seconds, you can either captivate them long enough to watch the video or they scroll away, never to see the video again. Now, social media is a vast and untapped topic that could spring many debates and lectures about its uses, its pros, its cons, and much more. But today, we aren't here to talk solely about social media. We are here to talk about, about public speaking and more specifically, effective speaking. Now, the term effective speaking is simply to speak in a clear and concise manner in order to keep the audience engaged long enough for the speaker to make their point and get their message across. Most people think that effective speaking will only take place in a public forum via speeches, lectures, panels, or just discussions or debates. But the world is changing. Information is being exchanged at a rate faster than speeches take to be completed. And we all know that if we want our ideas to survive, they need to be passed on from person to person. But if we continue to use a growingly obsolete method of communication, then eventually our ideas will no longer be passed on anymore and will simply cease to exist. We have to adapt. Social media is conditioning future generations to have the attention span of a fruit fly. And at the rate we're going, that's if we're lucky. 
In order to successfully convey a message to an audience, speakers need to change the way in which their messages can be communicated effectively. Two key components of effective speaking are brevity and clarity. But if the world is no, excuse me, if the world is no longer interested in listening to people speak, they're quick to tune out and seek entertainment elsewhere, more often than not on social media. The audience has no problem living without that piece of information. It's the presenters that need an audience, not the other way around. The presenters need to change their tactics to adapt to an ever-changing social media dominated world. Getting back to the original question, is effective speaking relevant in a world where social media is the norm and speeches are becoming more and more outdated? I would say that instead of effective speaking, we need to start working on effective communication. Speaking is no longer the only method of communication and it definitely isn't always the most effective. According to studies conducted by the marketing blog HubSpot, the ideal video time for YouTube creators are three minutes or over 10 minutes. Facebook, one minute. Twitter, 45 seconds. And Instagram, Instagram is just 30 seconds. Now, let me be clear that these are just the ideal video lengths for creators. Now, let's get into the reality of viewer lengths. According to a study conducted by Microsoft, nowadays people generally lose interest after about eight measly seconds, eight. And to put that into context, that would mean that social media is conditioning our brains to have an attention span less than that of a goldfish at nine seconds. A species that is mocked for its lack of intelligence has a higher attention span than us. I guess my food fly comment isn't that far off. But wait, it gets worse. Further studies conducted by HubSpot and another company, Buffer, found that 85 to 95% of viewers view social media on mute. Imagine all these creators trying to use the audio to their advantage and talking, but instead nobody can hear them and are only viewing their poorly chosen visuals that were supposed to accompany the main substance, the audio. Now enough with all the statistics. They are one of the other things that can immediately put people off. So now, with all the information, I will state my case. Effective speaking in the way in which we view it today is no longer relevant. We need to start modifying the standards at which communication is deemed effective in the first place. If videos on social media platforms such as Instagram have videos at less than 30 seconds and people still aren't completing those videos, Imagine how drastically we need to change the methods we use to convey our messages. We need to further increase the importance of brevity and clarity. If new forms of, of communication aren't accepted and adopted, then yes, the way in which effective speaking is judged will be outdated and no longer relevant. Thank you. Thank you, speaker one. Moving along, speaker two. Cadet Choice, Cadet Life, Science and Technology, Aviation, Canadian History, or Citizenship. Cadet Life, Science and Technology, Aviation, Canadian History, or Citizenship. Speaker number two. Many people have an event in their life a, that completely and irreversibly changes everything to come after. For many, this event is massive, like a wedding. For others, it's small. It's an everyday occurrence, like a conversation. I fall into that latter category. And if it weren't for the effects, the consequences of that everyday event in the timeline, the story of my life, it could be completely skipped over, forgotten. But that conversation that everyday occurrence was my decision to join cadets. Good afternoon, esteemed judges, fellow cadets, and welcome guests. I am Flight Corporal Mackey from Squadron 205 Kalisha, Royal Canadian Air Cadets in Nanaimo, and I'm going to talk to you today about the consequences of that life-changing event, my decision to join cadets. You see, before I joined cadets, I had few friends. I was the loner kid, but I'd always admired the 
popular kids for their seeming ability to always have friends. They'd never need to spend a lunch break alone. And I'd spent a good portion of my time trying to earn their respect and possibly become friends. So I too could never spend a lunch break alone. But after joining cadets, I found that I had a group that always had my back and I found a group that I could be myself in. I no longer needed to try to become a part of the group at school because I had my own. And cadets had always, always will and always has pushed its members to try their hardest and even more so with me. And I took that to heart. I tried everything I could, as hard as I could. I joined uh, marksmanship and effective speaking and almost immediately fell in love with both. Heck, I still adore both of them with all of my heart. And just this past summer, I got my level four marksmanship badge. And right now I am in a regional effective speaking competition. You see, that's different from activities before, as they weren't either entirely my choice or didn't really feel like doing them. But these activities in cadets have improved my work ethic. I, three years ago, I would never have dreamed of trying to put in the effort to make it to the regional competition, or I would have been content with a level one marksmanship badge instead of four. But now I feel that I've, I've improved my work ethic. I will put in the effort to accomplish something right. For example, now I can polish my boots while watching a three hour documentary on the history of archeology span in Kurdistan. And when it's done, I will look at my boots and say they're not shiny enough and find another documentary. And who knows if they're shiny enough after that. It's occasionally said by my friends that cadets has aged me and I have to agree with them. Uh, it's, it's a joke thrown around by some of them that I have the body of a 15 year old boy the mind of a 15, 50 year old man and the knees of a 150 year old corpse. That being said, the corpse died 150 years ago. Um, God, my knees hurt. But what I like to think is that there have definitely been a few people who've helped push me along. And one of those people is Flight Sergeant Costumo. Now, Warrant Officer Second Class Costumo. And despite only of meeting him this year at the Cadet Activity Programs over summer, uh, he's inspired me for the last while. You see, he'd, he'd always push me to do the best I could, always try harder than necessary, uh, because it is never truly that hard. And something that he did that was kind of inspiring and proved his love of history was he would wear um, historical menswear on uh, on civilian dress dates. For example, one day we went to a uh, wild play and he wore a full vintage vid, uh, business suit and did the whole thing in said suit, jacket and all. And ever since then, I've been more and more thinking that I like that. I want to emulate Flight Sergeant Cosimo in every way I can. And he is truly one of the biggest inspirations in my life that I never would have met without cadets. So I guess it could be said that cadets has changed my life in every possible way. It's changed how I dress, how I act, how I think, how I work, and it's given me things I can enjoy. But most importantly, it's given me a place where I feel like I can be me. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number two. Next, we have speaker three. Is effective speaking still relevant today in a society where social network dictates the pace of information? Is effective speaking still relevant today in a society where social networks dictate the pace of information? 
Speaker three. Information. Today, it's everywhere. Um, world news, just at the tip of a finger. With information so, so abundant these days, how relevant is effective speaking in a society today where social networks dictate the pace of information or have society let social networks dictate the pace of information? And is effective speaking truly irrelevant? Honorable, but honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, I am Flight Sergeant Jackson McGaw of 676 Kittyhawk, Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. What is a social network? Well, a social network is a dedicated app, application, or website that allows you to post information, images, comments, and all of that jazz. Some examples of a social network would include TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, just to name a few. These are able to dictate the pace of information because anyone, anywhere, is able to post anything they want. Now, this is a good idea in theory, right? You could get world news from, a, from across the world and just moments after that event happened. But I said, in theory. Now, why did I? Well, the problem with social networks dictating the pace of information is Whoever posts the information, or most of the time, it's not always 100% accurate, or the news could be overhyped, for example. However, you can make a counter argument saying just because you're able to speak effectively uh, doesn't mean you're telling the correct information, and you're absolutely right. But effective speaking has something that social networks will never have, and that's emotion. Emotion is so powerful when connecting to the individual. It's just something that social networks could never have. So for the average person, it's a lot harder to get up and get in front of a huge crowd and, and say random things and tell lies, right? But on social networks, you can just type whatever you want. So even though it is dictating the pace of information, the real, the valuable, and the moving information comes from effective speaking. So if, let's say, social networks dictate the pace of information, it makes effective speaking even more relevant, right? Because effective speaking has emotion. It has the ability to connect with you personally. You could be in front of a huge crowd and you could galvanize them to get a strong work ethic and a strong sense of morale, opposed to just going on social networks and being like, go team, right? There's a huge, huge difference in emotion in those two scenarios. Also, it's the person to person contact that makes effective speaking so much more relevant than per se social networks because you can just look at let's say instagram for example and look at a picture of your friend doing some weird thing like going water skiing or whatnot but you you don't have the story behind it you just read their caption it should it could just say gone water skiing had a blast right but if you were to go to your friend and they're to communicate with you effectively and say I went water skiing, it was really fun. Uh, I made all these great friends, right? You take something inside of you along, right? If anything, it can kind of take you to what they were feeling at that point in time. And that is why effective speaking has to still be relevant in today's society where social networks do in fact dictate the pace of information. Effective speaking is a skill and it's a skill that's being quickly forgotten. But the more we strive to make it even more relevant, the more we strive to become better speakers is what's important. Last year, I did an effective speaking competition and it went very poorly on my part. I had a full breakdown on camera, basically, um, because I couldn't get one word out. 
but you know after i watched a bunch of competitions online and stuff it really empowered me to get better at effective speaking because to me it is important effective speaking is still relevant because no message on a computer to try to comfort me in that scenario being like it's okay it's okay it, it wouldn't have like connected with me emotionally i needed that person to person contact and the judges after like with their words of reinsurance so that is why effective speaking still needs to be relevant and if we worked on it hard enough we could get it to dictate the pace of information but it needs everyone to work together and really strive to make effective speaking the proper way to give information thank you thank you speaker three moving along speaker four cadet choice cadet life science and technology aviation canadian history or citizenship cadet choice cadet life science and technology aviation canadian history or citizenship speaker four amari usk adamari from sea to sea that is this country's motto it means that from the pacific ocean to the atlantic on this land we are all Canadian. To me, however, this motto means that from the Atlantic Ocean back to the Atlantic Ocean all around the world, we accept everyone as Canadians. As of 2020, there are roughly 8 million immigrants living in Canada. Immigrants that have helped and continue to help our country grow. They have made incredible advances for Canada and themselves in fields like healthcare, business, engineering, and so many more. What's amazing to see is that any person that immigrates to Canada finds a way to make their citizenship their own and finds a way to make a difference. From sea to sea, they are Canadians. One such Canadian is Takwa Mak. After being raised in Hong Kong, Dr. Mak moved to the States for university, where he pursued a major in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin. He then moved to Canada to earn his doctorate from the University of Alberta. Takwa Mak started with a job paying $1.25 an hour to clean lab equipment, to then move up in his career to being the director of the Campbell Family Institute for Breast Cancer Research at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto. He and his colleagues have made huge contributions in the field of immunology can and cancer research by solving the structure of the T-cell receptor gene, allowing researchers to recognize what fights cancer at the cellular level. His paper has been cited nearly 1,200 times in other scientific studies around the world. The basic research in breast cancer conducted by Dr. Mock has been published in top international scientific journals, and he has given several keynote addresses at breast cancer symposiums across Canada and America. In spite of offers from prestigious institutions around the world, Takwa Mock remained committed to Canada's scientific community, and always will be. Based on his research, we have been able to forge a path further into cancer treatment and it has saved lives. Because Takwa Mak came to Canada and decided that he was going to leave his mark on our society, much like Rola Dagger. At just 16, Rola Dagger and her daughter immigrated to Canada from Lebanon to escape the ongoing civil war. When she came to Canada, she took whatever job she could get, which happened to be a job as a telemarketer for Bell Canada, and she fell in love with it. So she climbed up the ladder of her career until she left Bell to be the president of Cisco Systems Canada. Rola Dogger's persistence and courage created a new life for her and her daughter to thrive in. To this day, she's an amazing businesswoman advocating for mental health in the household and even put in place mental health supports for Cisco employees globally. For her work, she was named one of Canada's top 25 women of influence. Besides her work, though, one of the things that drew me to her is how she describes herself as a proud Lebanese and a grateful Canadian. Even though she immigrated to Canada so long ago, she'll never forget that part of her because she's both Lebanese and Canadian. That's part of the beauty of Canada. No matter where you come from in Canada, you're able to celebrate your heritage while also being Canadian. No one makes you choose. Rola Dagger made incredible advancements for not only immigrants, but also women in the workplace. And so did another female immigrant, Gina Cody. Ever since she was little, Gina Cody prided academics above all. She enrolled at the Sharif University of Technology in Iran, graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in Structural Engineering. She then looked for higher education at McGill University, but 
the amount of money she'd, Im she'd immigrated to Canada with wasn't enough to cover her tuition. Luckily, she got a meeting with the engineering professor at Concordia University, and because of her intellect, he offered her a full scholarship. However, being an immigrant woman in STEM did not come without hardship. She was constantly judged as being not as good by her male coworkers, but that pushed her even harder. In 1989, she became the first woman in Concordia's history to earn a PhD in engineering and climb the ranks until she became president of an engineering firm. Even though she is now retired, she is the face of Concordia's engineering program and inspired women in engineering everywhere. She donated $15 million to Concordia's engineering program. And with that donation, she said, and I quote, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, or wealth, everyone fully belongs to engineering. Just like her. She fought for her dream like every Canadian should. These three groundbreaking people will go down in history. They each paved the path for countless other immigrants in their fields. And hearing their stories is inspiring to say the least because they fought hard to achieve their goals. Each individual in Canada, immigrant or not, takes their citizenship and molds it to fit their aspirations and their dreams, weaving their own unique threads into the fabric that is Canada. I am proud of each and every Canadian forging their way into the future, working hard to strengthen the meaning of our country's motto, working hard to prove that in fact, from sea to shining sea, we are all Canadian. Thank you. Thank you, speaker four. Next, we have speaker five, Cadet Choice, Cadet Life, Science and Technology, Aviation, Canadian History or Citizenship. Cadet Choice, Cadet Life, Science and Technology, Aviation, Canadian History or Citizenship. Speaker number five. Humans have always wanted to create. Even before the wheel was invented, the first music had already been played. Yet back then, all music really was, was people banging two sticks together. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Sergeant James Leishman from the 22 Red Knight Royal Air Cadet Squadron. And my topic is music and its effects on the brain. The first drum was created with some animal hide around 5,500 BC, a date that is unimaginably so long ago. Soon after, real musical instruments started to pop up, such as wooden flutes. But those crude representations of music were created by Neanderthals. They had no sense in how to keep time or even what the music should sound like. But humans interpret music even without knowing what it should sound like. I'm sure that the music did not sound perfect, but it probably didn't sound as bad as we might think. As time continued to flow, more and more musical instruments came about in ancient civilizations such as ancient e Egypt with the harp and ancient China with many string instruments and the world's first wind instruments. But why would these ancient cultures want to create something like that? Well, music is different than most things. You can connect to it and it helps mold cultures and people together. The brain responds differently to music. Music is one of the only things that ties both sides of your brain together. When you play music, you're being creative, but you must also be rational or else it won't sound good. The music category has such a wide range of different styles and feels from Bach to Tupac and from Beethoven to Chuck Berry. If you listen, you may not be able to tell many similarities, but if you listen closely, there are many things in common which the brain picks up on without you even really knowing that it is. There are just a few small things that tie all music together that we can recognize. Back in the days of real classical composers, such as Mozart, Beethoven, and Bach, music was much more appreciated than it is today. Think of going back to the 17th and 18th centuries to go and listen to the opera or a classical concert. It was a big deal. People never got to listen to music at their own homes. It wasn't uncommon for people to not hear music for months at a time. Only the highest of upper class would listen to live music at their own homes. But other than that, the common folk would rarely hear music, which gave them a slight disadvantage at their brain developing. Someone like Beethoven, who by the time he was 45 had lost all his hearing, but that didn't stop him from composing more symphonies. He composed for so long that he became non-dependent of hearing and only needed to hear it 
in his brain. Beethoven's brain was unlike most with being able to write music for whole orchestras without even hearing what it would sound like. Beethoven wrote six symphonies while he was deaf and three while his hearing was fine. Most symphonies are about two hours long and thoroughly thought out. Beethoven had more gray matter in his mind than normal people. He also had an IQ of 145. I find it fascinating that he created some of the most famous pieces on earth and he didn't even get to listen to them. People who play an instrument have more connected brains and neural pathways than people who don't play music. Neuroscientists had 10 people take IQ tests before and after six months of musical training. The average IQ grew by about 20% in standardization tests in English and math. Playing music increases the amounts of gray matter in the brain. It improves your brain structure and better memory and attention. Gray matter is the part of your brain that contains intellect and nerve fibers. Einstein's parents had him play the violin from a young age, and he has said that the theory of relativity came to him while he was playing the violin. Einstein had an IQ of 160, but his brain was immensely different than most. Musical composers such as Mozart had, the IQ, had an IQ in the same range, but not as smart as Einstein, but similar. It wouldn't all be from music, but it would have played a big part. In conclusion, you can see that music is a wonderful thing that we should cherish and not take for granted. Music strengthens the brain and your ability to, ability to do many things unrelated to music. If you play an instrument, sing a song, or just listen to music, you will be better off and it will grow your mind in a vastly different way. Thank you. Thank you, speaker five. Now, this brings us to the conclusion of the prepared speeches from five cadets. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Tech support, I'll trouble you to transfer judges and tally people and timer into the judges room. And I will maneuver our cadets into the uh, briefing room to prep them for the impromptu section of competition. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back at it at the Vancouver Island Virtual Regional Effective Speaking Competition. This ha last half is going to be the impromptu section of competition. So we do have a cadet and the impromptu supervisor in the room right now. He is receiving his question and we are going to begin. So for impromptu section of competition, our cadets will be performing in reverse order. Uh, after the cadet is re finished receiving the uh, impromptu question, they'll receive three minutes to write up their speech, uh, and then they will come on out uh, to present to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have speaker five, and the impromptu question was, do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country slash local and why? Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country slash or local and why? Speaker five. I feel like I would prefer to buy from my local country because I don't have to worry about the uh, CO2 emissions from big barges going across the ocean or huge uh, jets flying across the ocean, putting lots of gases into the ozone layer. Uh, also, coming from Canada, hopefully and maybe the quality will be a lot better than from overseas. And hopefully the, the time that it comes to my door, it will be a lot quicker than coming from overseas. I think the main part is the CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and ozone layer because that's a big problem in today's world. And uh, yeah, it's a lot better to buy from your either home country, hometown, province, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, speaker five. All right, so. The way virtual competitions go, we are working off multiple devices and I'm finding out that I have 
uh, my cadet still has about uh, less than a minute inside that room to write up their speech in preparation. So with that, I have a arsenal of volunteers and uh, helpers, uh, our judges for one, our timers, and our tally people are also volunteers from our host squadron of 89 Pacific RCACS. And I thank them for, uh, for them locating these, uh, these volunteers for me. Okay, so I'm getting notification that our speaker for is ready. And we have speaker four. Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local and why? Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local and why? Speaker four. We all have basic needs, things that we need to buy, like food, water, basic necessities that you and I need. And, but it's always more expensive to buy local, right? Because it's, it's small businesses, they need more money, but it's better for you. And it supports the local businesses, it, su it supports your community. It makes you feel like you're part of something. First of all, buying local is very expensive. I, for one, am very broke. I don't have any money, but my parents on the other hand, they're able to buy local and it's, it's a really good thing that they're able to do that because when you support the local business, when you support the local businesses, it makes you feel like you're part of a community and you could say hi to a local business owner on the street, things like that, that make you feel happy. It's also way better for you. Local food is usually more organic and doesn't have the same kind of pesticides that food coming in from other countries would. Like, if I were to eat food from outside of my country with pesticides and stuff, if I get sick or die, how am I supposed to become president? How am I supposed to do that if I get sick? I don't know. You tell me. There's so many things that, that eating bad food would constrict us eating GMOs, it wouldn't let us do the kind of things that make us happy. So I love to buy local. Even though it is quite expensive, if you're able to afford it, it's a great idea. It supports your local businesses and it's way, way better for you. So buy local everyone, support your businesses, do the things that make you happy. Thank you. Thank you, speaker four. Speaker three, impromptu question is, do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local and why? Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local and why? Speaker three. My cadet uniform. I am so, so proud of it, but there's a reason why I'm proud of it. And it's not just because I'm part of an organization bigger than myself, but the uniform itself gives me something to be proud of. And that is it's made in Canada. Things that are made in Canada mean so much to me. And I will always try to buy things that are made in Canada because it's, it's supporting Canada. It's supporting our culture. It can support our diverse culture, and that's so important to me because you also know that whatever you're buying in Canada, the people who made it were being treated fairly and you know, got, got their money's worth out of it, their profit, instead of if you're to uh, so-called buy your product somewhere else in the world, maybe the workers don't have as many rights as us Canadians do. It also supports the Canadian economy. That is very important, especially over the last two years with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It has made Canadians have to band together and support each other. And supporting each other also includes buying things made in Canada. Because if we didn't buy things in Canada or made in Canada, our economy would have gone down more and maybe 
it would, we would have had to make some more financial cuts to the COVID relief effort. But because as Canadians, we bought, we bought local, uh, we bought things made in Canada, it, it really Im helped improve our uh, economy and get us through this COVID-19 pandemic. I also really appreciate the fact that the cadet program does give us our uniform that is made in Canada. I think it really brings uh, attention to like, as a cadet, we are representing Canada. You know, we're like the, we're a Canadian organization and we represent it. So it being um, worn and made in Canada just makes me so, so happy to be a cadet. So please, I urge all of you, whenever you can, please buy local Canadian made items. It supports our economy. It supports your neighbors. It supports everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker 3. Next, we have Speaker 2. Speaker 2, do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local and why? Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local? Why? Speaker 2. So in 2022, we live in a world where you can buy tea from the United Kingdom, foods from the Dominican Republic, and pens from China. And this is all fine and dandy when you just think about it as, well, they make good shoes, they make good pens, and damn British tea is great. But when you, uh, when you think about it closer, you realize that they're not necessarily on equal footing compared to what's made locally. Good afternoon, esteemed judges, fellow cadets, and uh, honored guests. I am Flake Corporal Mackey from Squadron 205 Kali Shah in Danaimo, and I'm going to talk to you today about if I like to buy goods locally. And to answer that quickly, um, I don't necessarily buy everything local, but local goods, especially when it comes to food, is always better. Uh, but however, I do buy my tea from uh, the United Kingdom and uh, occasionally, pens are definitely made uh, foreign. So when you do buy these foreign goods, uh, you have to remember that they had to be shipped. They had to be made in probably a factory. So all of the, all of the oil spent shipping it is definitely bad for the environment by any standard. And so you can't help but feel guilt whenever you buy your delicious British tea. So ethically, I think that, I feel that buying foreign goods is not as good. I prefer to buy local if I could, but Buying foreign goods is all, that, all that's there for most of the time for anything that isn't food. So in general, uh, I like to buy anything I can local. However, tea will always be an exception. That is all. Thank you, Speaker 2. And our final speaker, Speaker 1. Speaker one, do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local? Do you prefer to buy things which are made in your country or local? Why? Speaker one. As a parent, you would always want the best for your child and you would always want to see them succeed in life. Well, as a country, shouldn't that be the case as well? Aren't we all just one big family that want to see the betterment of our society and the betterment of our neighbors and our friends and our family? Wouldn't we want to see less of an, uh, a labor shortage and more happiness spread throughout the different communities? Wouldn't we want our people to feel better about themselves and have security for themselves, whether financially or actual security safety wise? Wouldn't we want to see the betterment of our economy as a whole rather than just a small community? 
wouldn't we rather have it in our country rather than another country? By giving it to the entire country on a national scale, we allow for the betterment of society on a national scale rather than a small community. You can have dozens of little communities that are thriving, that are perfect, that are the ideal paradise. But then you take one turn left and you see a struggling population that is desperate to survive, doesn't have enough food, water, doesn't maybe even doesn't have shelter. If we look at this on a national scale and we want the betterment of our society on a whole countrywide scale, we better the society of our country, not another country, not another country, not a small community, not dozens of little communities, but rather a, an actual whole country. Once the country's set, wouldn't that help the smaller communities? Wouldn't the larger Fortune 500 companies start having more jobs for the smaller communities, putting their massive factories in these small communities, in these rural areas where land is cheap and labor is cheaper? Wouldn't these small communities benefit from having everything on a national scale? So why wouldn't you want to have everything on a national scale rather than small communities or simply out of the country? Having it on a national scale would make sense because again, I've mentioned it, I think uh, five times now, but the betterment of our society along with our economy makes the most sense. It makes the betterment of society. It allows for the economy to run more smoothly than it did before. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. And that concludes our impromptu section of competition. And we are going to uh, keep the cadets uh, and the audience here with us. We're just going to do a few interviews with them just to get to know our cadets here. Uh, I will transfer our judges and tally people uh, timers into our judges room to culminate these numbers and come back to you with the three ranked names. To give them a bit of time, let's get to know our judges here. So Judge One, can you introduce yourself and uh, have a few words for our cadets? Good afternoon. My name is Henry Su, and I basically work as a coach, a facilitator for the Fraser Health Authority supporting family physician in the community. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for all the cadet for participating. It takes courage to stand up and uh, speak in front of a group. You know, public speaking is one of those top fear for most people. So uh, just having the courage to join this speaking contest and doing the speeches, kudos to you guys. Um, I do have a few tips and tricks for you guys that might help you in your next speaking contest. First things first, uh, I would like to applaud speaker one. Speaker one is the only one that actually stand up to do this presentation. Just because we're on Zoom, it doesn't mean you can't stand up and do your presentation. So I just wanna say kudos to him. For the rest of you, some general tips. Um, I know some of you guys were looking down. So if you guys were using notes, try not to use notes, try to memorize your speech if possible, at least the key points, and then just rehearse, um, that will help. The other thing is the eye contact with the audience. So I see a lot of you guys looking, maybe your camera's on the other monitor or whatever the case might be, but try to look at the camera, look at the presenter, look at the judge, look at Jermaine, your host, right? So we had our cameras on pretty much uh, most of the time. So there is a face, you can see the reaction, you can, you know, uh, react to the situation, okay? So try to make eye contact with your audience. The other thing is, bury your voice, right? Um, a lot of you guys were presenting like you were in school. So if you're passionate about music, Mozart was a great composer. You know, I love him. He's one of my favorite musicians, composer, right? Put your emotion into your speech. Um, speaker number four did that, right? So some of her emotion came through. So um, just and actually speaker number one, too, in the impromptu portion. So he was passionate and I could see that. So um, try to do that as well. Bury your voice, speech, volume, uh, everything else. Fluctuate it so your doesn't come across very monotone. Okay. 
The other last little thing is, you know, with the COVID time, Zoom is a new tool. Try to get familiar with the tools, uh, just even with lighting, with background. So some of you guys are in a space that's private or public or whatever the case might be. The background might not be ideal. So in my case, I'm in my spare bedroom and it's actually full of laundry in the background. So I didn't want to sort of distract you with my dirty laundry. So um, I pull up this nice little picture on the web just a few minutes prior to the actual competition. So um, yeah, something quick like that will basically keep your audience focused on you and not the background, okay? So uh, other little tips, lighting. You can see I'm in basement. So unfortunately it's fairly dark and the light is actually behind me. So actually if I just turn on the room light, it's actually, I'm totally black out. So that's why actually I have a little light on the side that I used to give a little light coming this way. So you can actually see my face. So lighting is another thing. Uh, so a little Zoom etiquette, you can Google that. So there's a lot of little tips and tricks that will help you. So make use of the tools you have. Uh, in this case, Zoom, there's actually a lot of bit of a tips and tricks that out there as well. Okay. Uh, I think that's basically it. I did put uh, one or two little notes in your evaluation form. So hopefully that's helpful. And once again, uh, you know, great job. Thank you for speaking up. It does take courage to, to do public speaking. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Sue, for your comments. And next, we're going to have uh, our Judge Chu. Judge Chu, if I could trouble you to introduce yourself and say a few words for our cadets. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Captain Daniel Colosi, Commanding Officer of 737 Air Cadets in Manitoba, Thompson, Manitoba up here where it's still snow and probably will be for a couple more months. <laughs> the um, competition today, I got involved last year. Uh, Jermaine and Catherine dragged me in last year and uh, had me involved at every level of competition. And I was definitely happy they asked me back this year to be part of this. So thank you guys for having me and uh, letting me participate with you guys. Awesome job to all of the cadets. Uh, in my civilian job, I work as a training and safety coordinator for an airline. Uh, and so I do a lot of speaking to groups about the safety stuff and some of it where the people don't necessarily want to hear your message. Here you have a very receptive audience, people who are listening to what you have to say with kind of a, a blank slate, if you will. They're willing to let you imprint your ideas onto them. That's not always the case. So think about your effective speaking from the perspective of someone who um, might have to deliver an uncomfortable conversation or a difficult conversation at some point where you have to make the person understand why your opinion is your is the position that you take or the reason that you're giving that conversation as well. Other than the officers that we've been introduced, I spot a CV from 676 Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. Do you want to say something to our cadet? Yeah, uh, just uh, very briefly. I mean, I think there's been some great points made by all the other judges, so I, I won't repeat them, but I, I just wanted to say that it's really great to see the uh, diverse range of talent that's, uh, that's visible across the Vancouver Island region. And um, congratulations to all of you, no matter how you place, I hope that you'll continue using these skills and uh, continue in the effective speaking program because we all benefit from your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, do you see the lovely background for Captain Colosi and Mr. Slavsky? It was made by Captain Colosi for our national competition. You can see there is the 80 years crest of the Air Cadet League of Canada. Catherine, it's Doug. Can I say a few words? Absolutely. Yeah, just, just thought I'd say for the for the people on the screen who don't know who I am, uh, I'm a national vice president of the Air Cadet League, and I live in Nanaimo. But I was uh, I'm a past CEO of uh, four different squadrons on the island over a period of time, and a past CEO of two summer training centers, one at Albert Head and. Uh, so I just thought I'd pass it on in case I know some of you are looking saying, who the heck is this guy talking on here? But that's my background. 
you have a long list of your title, actually. <laughs> so um, may I have Tally person to rename yourself? Would like to know who you are? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, Edward Camilleri, and um, I was uh, have been a volunteer with 89 Pacific for uh, quite a long time. Uh, my son went through the program uh, several years ago, and now he's a pilot with 408 Squadron, um, presently training in Alaska. Um, and yeah, so that's me. Thank you, and thank you for your help today. And looks like we have the results. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And uh, to introduce Catherine Chak, she has been um, <clears throat> assisting me for two years uh, with this effective speaking program and learning about how to uh, perform a virtual effective speaking competition online. Uh, and she's been paramount in doing the logistics and um, helping me with uh, getting this impromptu supervisor down to a T. So thank you very much, Ms. Chak. She is also a league rep with BCPC uh, with 888 Vancouver. Now, I think I've kept you in suspense for long enough. Mr. Slowski, can you confirm that you've received the three names under the chat? Yes, confirmed. Thank you, sir. And I'll bring up the slides now. Pardon me here. I'm going to share screen. Mr. Slowski, if I can have you announce our Vancouver Island Regional Effective Speaking winners. Yes. Uh, starting off with the bronze. Uh, congratulations to Flight Sergeant McGaw from 676 Kitty Hawk. Thank you so much, sir. Like Sergeant McCall, you'll be receiving that bronze medal on this that you see on the side there uh, through snail mail. Excellent. Thank you so much, ma'am. Right from second one. Ready okay, you are, the sir. silver medal uh, goes to uh, Corporal Kish Badani from 89 Pacific Squadron. Congratulations. And now that you're what you're all waiting for, the gold uh, medal and a chance to compete in the provincials is uh, Flight Corporal Kitreddy from 848 Royal Roads. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Bravo to Bravo Zulu to all the candidates that have come out to participate at this Vancouver Island Regional Effective Speaking Competition. I am so proud of you all and I hope that you continue on this uh, development because this uh, effective speaking is such a life skill and I would like to see uh, you have this opportunity to come out to participate at our provincial effective speaking competition on April the 23rd 2022 I will fire off uh, a mass email with the provincial competition details to you uh, we will have I believe it is Flight Corporal uh, Kedredi. Uh, receive, you'll be receiving an email with details of how to prepare yourself. I will also send it forth to everyone. Now, at this point, cadets, I'd like you to be aware we will be snail mailing out the bronze pins, the certificate of merit, and the judges evaluations out to you as soon as possible, as well as those that are medalists will receive the medals in that package. Judges, uh, you have sent me your, e your mailing addresses. I would like to send out a small gift of gratitude for, uh, to you for taking the time out of your Sunday afternoon to be with us today. And uh, I'd like to also thank our host squadron, 8-9 Pacific, our CACS uh, and their SSC for helping me find the volunteers and making this virtual effective speaking competition such a success. My appreciation goes out to the coaches, the officers, the judges, parents, and the cadets uh, for uh, coming out and teaching these uh, young people such a uh, important skill. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, our BCPC for their support in this effective speaking program. This concludes our 2022 virtual Vancouver Island Regional Effective Speaking Competition. I'd like to thank you and have a great rest of your day.